Hi, Patty Burgess. I am so happy to have you today on Dying Your Way podcast. I am um, thrilled and happy to see your face. It always <laughs> yes. to make, brings a smile to my face. Um, I want to introduce you to our listeners and um, share with them your amazing bio and who you are and why I'm so excited to, to have you here. So just sit back and listen to these wonderful oh. things about you. Okay. You are meeting Patty Burgess. She is the founder of Teaching Transitions and also of Doing Death Differently. She is a trainer and instructor. She's an end of life educator and speaker. She's an end of life doula and a consulting doula. She's a founding member of NEDA, which is the National Inner Life end of life alliance doula alliance she's a founding member this is huge of nhpco which is the national hospice and palliative care what does the co stand for the uh, that's right the uh, care organization care and organization. the end of life doula council end of life doula and so they have the national uh, hospice and palliative care organization has formed within it an end of life Doula Council, which you were a founding member of. She's a certified grief recovery specialist, and she's a former hospice volunteer and community educator. And now she trains other hospice volunteers. And she's a YouTube talk show host called The Death Chicks. I love that. And, you know, there's just so many wonderful things about Patty, but I, one of the things that she talks about is seeing an approach of leaning into death, which is a way to dramatically change those facing the end of life for them and for their loved ones. And we'll be talking a lot about how it is, how you actually lean into death and uh, have a good death because of that. I met Patty in New York City in 2000 and... Was it 18? 18, it was when, yeah. <laughs> So it was during a three-day workshop that we had in New York City that was sponsored by the National End of Life Doula Association. And Patty, I was instantly struck by your knowledge base, by your kindness, and by your, wow. profession, your professionalism. I mean, I think if I was going to define you in three ways, it's, it's um, very broad brushstrokes of who you are, but those are qualities that I was interested instantly struck by and we're continuing our connection just afterwards i started my own business you have always been so supportive and so encouraging of what i've been doing and we're going forward working on new projects together that i know we're both really excited about yeah. but all of this is geared to improving the quality of life at the end of life so well so patty thank you i feel like looking over my shoulder like who's she who's she talking about i'm, I'm obviously a hard act to follow or something i know, I know. you are a hard act to follow but here you are Oh my gosh, that's so great. Thank you, Claire. It's so, it, it is amazing to, you know, I feel like we're in this club that doesn't really have any dues. It's like this death club, you know, where, where, you know, a kindred spirit when they show up and, you know, nowadays it's a virtual hug. Back then it would be a regular hug. And so um, I, I'm just so grateful for you and the work you're doing here too. I mean, well, I what say you do. taught me everything I know. Oh. <laughs> you've really been a mentor to me. Um, I know that you've you've got a a story about what it was um, yeah. that brought you to even be doing the work that you're doing. So I wondered if you'd be willing to share a little yeah. bit about what brought you to this work. Sure. You know, um, I think like most of us who are doing this. Um, maybe a few, but not all of us kind of just wake up one day and say, yeah, I think I'm going to hang out with some dying people. Usually there is some impetus. And in my case, I cannot believe that it's um, about 21 years ago uh, now that um, I was, I ended up being with a dear friend who worked with me um, every day from diagnosis to death. In fact, I was with her at her diagnosis, which was when she not when I when she was at the doctor's office getting this diagnosis, and you know one day um, she wasn't coming um, downstairs to the meeting room to have this meeting, and I went up, 
and saw her on the phone and she was crying. Mm -hmm. And I said, Rona, what's going on? And she said, and, and we could do a whole podcast on this, but um, she said, I'm talking to the doctor's office. And she had shared with me that she had kind of a cough and a pain in her back. Like who hasn't had a cough and a pain in their back, you know, like, and she was just getting over the flu and she was asking the doctor's office to give her the results of her test. And when she said, well, can't you just tell me over the phone? And they, and she said, is it bad? The doctor's office said, well, if we can't tell you, what do you think? Oh no. And it was like, oh my God. So we packed up, drove right down there that moment and said, tell them we're coming down. And it was a pulmonologist and um, we went to see her and he was visibly shaken because when you saw my friend Rona, who was 45 years old at the time, she had three young boys, ages 13, 11, and nine. Mm -hmm. And um, she uh, was not the picture of cancer, but he gave her at that meeting a uh, um, end stage, stage four lung cancer diagnosis. And um, the drive back for the two of us was so incredibly surreal. Um, she, uh, you know, it, it was one of those things where it was, it's really even hard even today to put into words. Um, but I, I kept thinking, why is it? Like, I'm the couch potato and she's the one that would go out and run 5Ks. How come it's over there and hers were driving home? Why not me? And then that started this exploration. And of course, that's, an unanswerable question, right? Why anything? Yeah. Why them? Why me? Why anything? And so that kind of began the, the dive, the lean in. It was when a lot of other people were kind of running away. And it was so interesting because throughout the time we all spent, all the people that supported her um, through this journey and through, you know, her diagnosis to death, there were a lot of people that were supporting her. Um, and she would give, oh my gosh, she was funny. She would give everybody a certain title, depending upon who they were and <laughs> like what they were about. So Anne, who she named manager, not even the manager, manager, or Anne would just coordinate everybody. Like, you know, there was no like, uh, let's talk about this. It was like, you've got Thursdays for the cash roll and you've got, so Anne was the manager. And I would find myself, um, Ron and I would talk a lot about, what might come after or what next years yes transitions. and transitions like what what might she experience and she would end up you know we talk about deathbed visions in our work and she would end up going back and forth and i would kind of travel with her on these were they out of body experiences whatever and so she came back and gave me the title of um, director of possibility and uh, it's funny because the title I, the title I used today. Well, before she died, I said, "Listen, it's kind of a better alliteration if I say President of Possibility. Can I have a promotion and a raise?" Well, she was like, "Oh yeah, you can have the promotion. I didn't, no raise here." So that's how it all got started. Where I just got curious, and a lot of other people were dropping off the casserole and leaving quickly. I, there was something palpable in this space. And it was a draw, and that's how it got started. Wow. So. And what were, what were the two of you doing? What work were you doing when you were working together before she got the diagnosis? I'm just, was it in death and dying or hospice? No, or? not at all. As a matter of fact, it was um, so different. Um, I had ha I've had a lot of different um, healthcare businesses. Um, one, gosh, starting out early on was uh, alternative care networks, marketing to HMOs and HMOs back then, now it's managed care. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, I had also started a cosmetic surgery consulting business, uh -huh. which um, as a result of, now this is all aftermarket, no, I'm teasing you. <laughs> I'm really 80 years old. No. <laughs> That's right. I've had a little help from my friends. Um, <laughs> so I had had this amazing experience with having um, a rhinoplasty and a couple of other things done. But I recognized that people were falling into some, um, at that time, falling into some hands that, you know, people trying to get into that business. I'd also had a managed care background where we were credentialing doctors. So oh. I kind of married the two, started credentialing plastic surgeons to make sure people were making safe, informed decisions. And it is so interesting because I look at 
the thread throughout my whole career, which was healthcare and putting things together that mm -hmm. normally weren't put together, like credentialing and cosmetic surgery. Um, and then, so, so we were working on, we were working on that and that completely changed my direction. We wanted to have people make safe and informed decisions. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that funny? Cause today I want people to have oh safe and God. informed decisions. And people used to say, well, like, what's that connection between cosmetic surgery and death? I'm like, hmm, looking good before you die. I, I, I don't know. You're going to be a pretty corpse. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Oh yeah. So well, go ahead. That time, oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I'm sorry. And you um, guys were working together at that time. We were working together and she was oh, God, a hilarious woman. Um, in fact, um, she was uh, she was a, a Jewish girl from Philly, and so I'm from Philadelphia, and we really bonded. And we were in the Deep South; we were in Atlanta on that one. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, she used to laugh. She was she didn't do chemo because at the time she's like, you know, she had really curly hair. She's like, I just got my hair at age 45 the way I wanted. I am not losing it now, you know. So, oh my God, this there we were in the midst of death. And it was this, this is, I think what just grabbed me was it kind of opened up this bandwidth how of emotion where we as humans, I think live so narrowly what's right. And, you know, making sure we don't show who we really are. And then kaboom, I end up in this death experience, death and dying experience and everything is out the window and we get to experience this full bandwidth of emotions from heartbreak to hilarity like in the same moment from you, you name it and it was just like well I gotta lean into this because there's something going on here I don't understand she changed my life as hers was ending my life was changing well I may be asking you to jump over a few steps here but I know that yeah. you are just like one of the pioneers and founders of the doula movement in the United States of America. And in that capacity, the, the, the highs and the lows that you must have happened as you are forming and storming to make this happen and be recognized with the National Hospice and Palliative Care folks. And you know, what, how did you do that? And what were the highs and lows? And how did you do that? Just tell me. Yeah. Yeah. How did you do it? Um, my gosh, it was a lot of probably um, working on something, throwing myself on the bed and crying, getting back up, dusting off, throwing myself on the bed again, like, like we all have. To me, this um, movement, um, the business of this movement is really quite a spiritual path. Yeah. Um, you know, you ask about a low point and, and I can tell you, I think in some ways it, um, there's a, a bit of it that exists today, but um, frankly, this low point came actually within the movement where um, there are kind of a couple of different camps where doulas, they're very well-intentioned, um, beautiful, wonderful people who feel very strongly that the doula movement should not be um, anything that has anything to do with payment, compensation, should not be monetized. And it was sad to me because um, we could see the rift and we could see within the movement um, a lot of uh, anger. You know, we're in this age of social media and we say things to uh, each other on social media that we might not ever say in person. Mm -hmm. And I saw some things like this explode as uh, we, and, and I'm firmly in the camp of uh, for a movement to be professionalized and legitimized and sustainable, right. that we need to care for those people who are caring for others and how do we do that? Mm -hmm. And the reason it was sad to me was because I look at, uh, I'm very involved in both sides. Um, for example, I work with, as you mentioned, hospices across the country who are, we train their volunteers. Right. And I have such a heart it's how I started. I became a volunteer, volunteer trainer, community educator after my experience with Rona. And um, as important as volunteering is, and we encourage everybody to do it, what happens there is that um, volunteering can only happen after people do their work, they take care of their family, 
they take care of all of the other things. And then generally, by definition, those volunteer hours are after everything has been done. Mm -hmm. And we know that people don't die when volunteers are, are there. So then the other side of it is, um, how do we get this movement, what doulas do, uh, which is non-medical, loving uh, support, holistic you know, physical, mental, spiritual support for the dying and their families. How do we do that and make sure more people can access this? Well, we have to make it a sustainable business. And it was sad to me that those people were somewhat demonized when we don't do that to other movements, like the companion care. You mean the, the, people, the people that wanted to just do it as a heart centered free thing were for yeah. but having it, a, a lot of trouble. But the, the problem with that is, and I think we are all, we're all heart-centered and, yes. and would do it for free. Yes. However, if we want to do it, we've got to right. be able to pay our bills, you know, feed our family. Exactly. Put if the it's time a, to it and have that flexibility of someone's death and dying schedule that we can drop what we're doing and give them yes. the full attention that they deserve and need. Exactly. And I understand, I mean, and it's funny, it came really home to roost for me because I remember putting out early on um, when I was starting to get involved with uh, more, because I started on the hospice side and there's a lot of wonderful, beautiful oh. people who've come before me in the doula world. I just tend to, I think everybody's, training is really a, a reflection of what their particular lens and focus is. Mm -hmm. And mine has come from healthcare and business. It's so, so I've always seen the two married beautifully. And when it's delivered well, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, it's, it's that kind of rift or that kind of tension is almost necessary, I think, in a movement. So I don't begrudge it at all, but it was a low point. For me personally, I remember putting out um, something about, you know, this beautiful doula work. And if you could do this as a living, would you? And I don't know, at the time, 60, 70, 80 people sent back, yes, 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 I'm in, I'm in. And one person said, you must be a really nasty person if you would charge for this. <gasps> you know, and that, you know, how, what is that about human nature that we've got 60 or 70 beautiful affirmative comments and then the one we concentrate on? Well, I will, well, take, I'll take it a step for, further. Oh, yeah? I think, that, I think that family members who are the primary caretakers and down the road, public policy that they are reimbursed for the, yes. for the care that they give. I mean, I, I did that for six years for my both of my parents and it's statistical that you lose about a half a million dollars, not only in wages and benefits, social security benefits and your retirement benefits. You lose about a, a half a million dollars on average. I had no idea that was the statistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. So, I mean, it's not just doulas, it's also those primary caregivers that need yes. to be reimbursed. Really, really good point. And I know um, in talking with some elder care attorneys about that very thing, there are now such things as care contracts. Some friend of my, friends of mine in New Hampshire took care of um, her mother and they were able to be paid out of the, the uh, estate. And it was nominal. I mean, it was nominal, but it, it gave them the ability to continue to eat and, not, and care for their mom the way that they, they right. wanted to and the way that she wanted to be cared for. Right. So. So people yeah, want to be it, in their homes. They want to be in their homes. You know? Yes, they definitely do. And um, yeah, so so I see this. So that was that was a low point, but it was a necessary point because I think we're out of that infancy stage where nobody really knows and people aren't like uh, an end of life what like scratching their head. You know, now it's not mainstream, certainly, people are beginning to hear about it, but I still think we're in that sort of clunky toddler stage where, like, we're walking a little wobbly, and, you know, we fall over, and then new things happen, but, for example, uh, National End of Life Doula Alliance, which is a membership organization, now over, I think, 300 or so strong, 
yeah. end of life doula council with the national hospice and palliative care organization. What an acknowledgement that was amazing that mm -hmm. they acknowledged that this movement was here. They also acknowledged that hospices had and hospices is, is their membership and they acknowledged that there were varying degrees of embracing doulas. Some hospices were really pushing back thinking, Hey, we do all that. Why do we need them? Mm -hmm. Others were saying we don't offer 24 seven care. We can't be there. So, yeah. So Patty explain, I mean, this is what this whole podcast every time is about, but I just think it's always good for the listeners to hear different voices say from their point of view, if you were going to give a description of an end of life doula, and what benefit or what a doula brings to the table, how would you define that role for the listeners? Um, well, in its pure, let's say, a definition, I would say that uh, a doula is non-medical, holistic support, which includes physical, uh, emotional, spiritual support for the dying and their families. And that can mean very different things depending upon what an individual doula is bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. That may be some of the things I think that are most connected with or associated with a doula would be um, bedside vigil in those could be weeks, uh, days, hours before death that um, things are changing on a regular basis uh, in terms of what that family sees, how they understand it, that that doula can be a really uh, beautiful and loving guide to help families understand this being a normal part of the life cycle and and um also being able to care for that person in the way that they have um verbalized that they want to be if they can so that sort of is like the the pure definition but a, a personalized version of that is when I was with my own mother who was dying. Um, thank goodness that she planned. She didn't plan it this way, but I see it as she planned for the fact that um, both my brother and I could be her children at her bedside, not her caretakers. Mm -hmm. Because what a different role, right? Like I could be so fully present. Um, with her, there was nothing left unsaid. We could walk through those places where she was conscious and aware and went together and have this beautiful exchange uh, because she planned for us to be there where we didn't have to worry so much about her physical comfort that was taken care of. Mm -hmm. And as a daughter, as a mother, what, we care about our loved one's physical comfort as sort of like the basis yeah. so that we can do those bigger tasks. So. Um, I see it as um, the place where we get to be, truly be with, and I mean that B in a capital B-E, yeah. and we let those who are the professionals take care of the things that um, they're good at, and that's what doulas do, is lovingly escort patients to whatever's next, next yeah. and lovingly, lovingly care for families who for most of us may only see or experience or witness maybe one, two, three, four deaths in a lifetime. Right. Um, it's like, you know, birth. Uh, it's, it, I thank so much the birth doulas um, who have paved the way for us because, um, you know, back in the, back in the what 60s and 70s when I was growing up it just seemed like, Ooh, that's what the hippies did. You know what I mean? With birth doulas. And now, we're like mainstream people talk doulas all the time, which is what they mean. And that's the same thing with, with birth is lovingly escorting this life in and caring for those who are doing the hard labor to do that. Mm -hmm. And we get to do the same thing on, you know, uh, this, this most sacred passage where there's labor yeah. and we get I, to, to help that. I like to, um, uh, think of myself as a patient advocate and like any, yes. I mean, any dual, I mean, if the earlier you start working with a client, the better yeah. because 
we, besides hospice and palliative care and hospice volunteers and a few well-informed doctors, really are the only ones that are trained in right. death and dying. And I think in working with people, you know, you can anticipate for them, before them, those transitional moments. And every time there's a transitional moment, that's when things can just kind of go, and we kind of make, like it not, make it not go that way because yes. we're leading them in a direction with choices and options and guidance that they are empowered to choose, but they're not making this last minute emotional yes. fraught decisions. And I think I also, and I'm sure you do too, find yourself in the middle of some family differences that you step in mm. as a third party to be a unbiased advocate for the patient. But you end up working with a lot of family issues as well that are uh, also, it's an honor to uh, to support them in a way where they can lift up the situation higher and higher and higher and higher, yeah. you know, and it's, it's theirs, you know, it's theirs and it's not ours. In fact, I was going to ask you, you know, we talk about what a doula does and everybody brings different things to the table as a doula. Right. What, what's your, what's your sweet spot or your happy place or um, what, what do you find is the place where you can best serve another well, I mean, a lot of times, you know, when people are, it doesn't really matter the stage because you do get calls where it's really kind of too, I don't say too late in the game. There's always something that can be provided at any stage along the way. Sure. But um, having people that get a diagnosis that would before be like, you'd think that you were going to die soon now because of the miracle of modern medicine, you go, okay, you have congestive heart failure, you know, mm -hmm. but you could live for decades with congestive <laughs> heart failure. So right. let's just start looking at that. Let's start planning around that. Let's make some lifestyle adjustments. Let's talk to your doctor, you know, let's get a prognosis, you know, and let's just work with some facts and trying to work with people in a way that's um, not so emotional. I think I'm kind of practical, yeah. you know, yeah. in how yeah. I work with people and trying to um, just empower them to make their own choices, but letting them take responsibility to, you need to know what your prognosis is. No, you need to make your advanced care planning. Here are the things that need to be in place, you know, and here are some high end choices. Here are some low end choices, but they need to be made. Right. You know, where right. do you want, if you were going to die in a year, where do you want to die? Who yeah. do you want to be with? You know, what do you want to do with all this stuff that's in your house? You want to stay in your house? Let's clear a path so people yes. can come in, you know, and feel welcome to come in and support you and serve you. So there's just a lot of, I mean, everybody's different. Everybody has a different scenario. But uh, the, the people that have those aha moments that you can see that it makes a difference, that's yeah. the sweet spot. That's oh, right there. that's wonderful. Well, and I noticed in, um, cause I had signed up for your newsletter and I noticed in your communications that that was something that came through that, um, I think it was one of the first ones that when you get this diagnosis, it is overwhelming. And how does somebody think, and especially let's say they're, they're older, maybe have an older spouse who really can't care give, um, the way that you want it to be, or someone's alone. I just love the way that you like acknowledge the shock mm -hmm. and then, wow, let me help you. And a lot of times people can't find their way through that. Mm -hmm. It's too confusing. It's too upsetting. It's too personal. And that's a beautiful example of what a doula can do is okay, you're going to make some decisions. You're going to be empowered, but we're going to do this together. 
Now, and I asked a doctor one time with someone that I was advocating for, I was actually like there when he got out of surgery and taking him to um, home and getting the outpatient instructions and everything. And he was still under, but I was talking to the doctor and I was just like, how many of the patients that you have in the circumstances have family that are like, you know, picking them up and taking them, you know, getting all this information yeah. and taking care He's about 50%. Wow. My jaw dropped. <laughs> My jaw dropped, you know. I mean, there are so many people out there that are not getting uh, appropriate care once they leave a hospital, you know, and go home. You know, how in the world are they going to get through those next few hours, you know? If, yes. I don't know. It's, it's a challenge yeah. for a lot that, of people. That, that, that. And they don't know. Little they don't know what to even ask for, what's out there to ask. Absolutely. For. And, you know, it's funny you say that because, well, one, you're usually still under when you're getting instructions. Mm -hmm. That That's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And and two, even the strongest, my mother was a very, very strong, independent woman, very, I, I used to call her an original for her um, age and stage. And yet I saw when she went through this and got her diagnosis, it, it really came down to, um, well, I guess the doctor says this. And I was like, where did you go? Like we, we have lots of questions to ask and we have lots of things to do and she couldn't do it. And then when she went through her rounds of chemo because of the effect on her physicality, she didn't have that same mentation. She didn't have that same ability. And I thought if the strongest woman I know is having difficulty um, communicating what it is she needs or wants, mm -hmm. how do the people who have no advocate do that. It's, it's, it's a shame. It really is. So you, bless you. you bless you for doing well, us. I mean, you just fall victim to whatever treadmill, medical treadmill you get on, you know, yes. you just turn into a totally unempowered person. And Absolutely. That's, that's wrong. Yeah. yeah. So going on to another question, okay. if you could, yes. if you could do anything or everything to put in place so people had what they call a good death or a natural mm -hmm. death. I mean, you could say sacred death, but it doesn't even have to be sure. spiritual. What would, what needs to be in place to make that happen? Or what, if you could yeah. have anything, there were no, there were no, um, you can have anything in this example. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, certainly a seaside view. Um, but other than that, um, two things that just kind of come to mind is, um, who was that? Was it Herbert Hoover who said like a chicken in every pot? I say a doula at every bedside, <laughs> number one. Like, let, let's make this mainstream. And again, back to the way we make it mainstream is we really support this, this movement in a lot of different ways. And it doesn't have to be just private pay. It could be going into your community, partnering with hospitals to uh, have them raise funds together for underserved communities if that's where your heart leads you to, to go. So there's so many ways to do this. But, um, you know, on a more esoteric level versus practical, and I, I love to work on both. I think that's the Libra in me. I can see this. I can see this. Um, and sometimes, and what I do love about death and yeah. is that we can hold opposing thoughts in one entity, our bodies, our minds, where, you know, like some people are, you know, you're, you're grieving, yet there's beauty. Mm -hmm. There's heartbreak, as I said before, there can be hilarity. We can do this. We're really, this is advanced humanity here. And I think we don't give ourselves enough credit. Yeah. And we need to start, and I think we're doing it in the doula community and end of life community. We're all breathing the same air about what death can mean mm -hmm. um, in terms of, to me, death is like this, this great equalizer, number one. I mean, we're all going to go through it. So we're not that different. It, it, it's the great connector in that way. And it's a great mystery and kind of like, who doesn't love a great mystery? Yeah. And if we can, and there's so many places to go with that from, you know, 
if one's interested in death, they can go into, you know, the healthcare side of it, um, after death, communication, after life, uh, mm -hmm. chaplaincy, bereavement, grief. It, it's, it's this, this, a never ending giver to me of life in a way. Yeah. So <clears throat> I would love to see that, um, we find ways to take this death education, death positivity, um, into um, places earlier, into schools where, you know, kids are just, we don't have all that uh, stuff that uh, we get from being on the planet for a while, all the, all the biases and all of the um, indoctrination about what something is. If we can open up the minds of some of these young people, and I'm seeing it. Have you, have you noticed some younger folks who are being attracted to this? Millennials are early yes. planners. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I've been amazed. We also offer um, uh, our, one of our programs in um, some colleges and universities. And uh, death courses are like, you know, maybe That's it's the curiosity what? factor or what? Very yeah. popular. Yeah. And um, I just think if we can start, because, you know, we're, we're going to be dying off mm -hmm. and um, seeing more men. Uh, I'd love to, to meet Terry, who's doing, I mean, so many things. I don't know if I can, do I have a limit to how many things I want? You said I didn't, right? No, you <laughs> so. have no limits at all. You go. Just take the list. Early. More me <laughs> Early. Early. <laughs> more men, more young people. Young mm -hmm. people whose minds are open to these possibilities, who kind of already have this this hope sort of built in where maybe the rest of us have it sort of, you know, have the hope sort of uh, pushed out of us by the time we read, reach a certain age. And um, yeah, I, I just see that we can make this interesting and we can start to tap into people's natural empathy and compassion and bring about a movement that is like, unlike any other, because it's happening to all of us. And I'm always shocked where people will plan more for a vacation or, you know, we, than a, than a, than a death or like, you know, we don't look outside or buying a car. We don't look outside in the driveway and go, oh my God, look, a new car popped up. Like, yeah. no, we, we plan for that car. I know. So, no. Let's you know, I, I have, I wanted to talk about this because, you know, I have a lot of things that roll around in my head about public policy and, and, you know, probably in a, in a next life or something, I'll, I'll be a politician or legislator or something, <laughs> but not now. But, yeah, not now, not now. But, but I really would love to see doctors so on board with the value of um, supporting their their patients that they are giving these uh, life-threatening diagnoses to, that they just, you know, look, I'm just going to introduce you to this patient advocate. She'll be there if you, if you guys click, she'll be there throughout and we'll answer all of your questions and we will work together to, to validate you in every way. And that doula knows that there is access to palliative care right off the bat. There is access to community nursing right off the bat. You want to stay in your home? Well, we're going to make that yes. happen. You know, we're going to save money for the healthcare system because you're not going to go to the hospital as much. You're not going to have these ridiculous procedures yes. unless you yes. want it. And if you want it, we're going to make sure all of that happens too. It's going to be your choice and we're going to support you to do that and she's going to be the person or he's going to be the person that's going to take you down that path and that just happens from the very beginning of oh my god you know, when your friend got that diagnosis she wow. had you but everybody needs a you everybody you know i i feel like i feel like the heavens just opened and they're singing and Ooh. like claire, claire for president get her in the office <laughs> Because, you uh, know, like, and we know you're in Australia right now, I'm in the States and different countries have different health policies and, you know, that's a whole nother discussion. No, but they have same, they have a lot of similar issues. They just have free health care. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, free, well, that, <laughs> that's yeah. a pretty, it's a pretty big difference. Yes. Um, 
but yeah, yeah, yes. Because, and you know, isn't this what we're kind of in some senses working on now together, this um, new, new project that we've come Maybe. together on? Be yes, because I think what it does is it, you know, we're in the process of training. We can talk about what this is, but we're in the process of training advanced yeah, care planning ahead. educators. Go is ahead that, and talk about, talk about it. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So this is so exciting to me. Um, this is like one of like the many high points. In fact, somebody had once said, if you're not having like the best day of your life within the last two weeks of your life, then you need to get out of the house more or something because I've been so jazzed about this experience. You know, a lot of people say the best day of my life was in 1970. It's like, Oh honey, we need to get some more best days in there. But, um, so as I think I alluded to or shared is one of my passions is being able to get doulas to a place where they, um, are in a sustainable uh, business. And that is doing this work for hire uh, as an independent contractor, as a community doula, however that works. And, you know, that's, we're still in, in that kind of infancy and toddler stage as well. So one of my passions is trying to find those places where doulas and the possibility of being able to um, earn a living doing this work comes together. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, several years ago, I started looking into the fact that, um, gosh, it was in, well, 2013, it started getting discussed. 2016 in the States, Medicare came across and said that doctors can charge for advanced care planning conversations. Mm -hmm. Wow, sounded great. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, is that um, most doctors, save for a few beautiful, wonderful doctors out there doing some of this work, they're not trained in these conversations. They don't have the bandwidth, you know, managed care is squeezing their time so much. They don't have the bandwidth. Their staff may take care of this, but their staff is overwhelmed. So um, I still was trying to figure out the fact that there were these codes that they could charge for. Could doulas somehow be involved in this? And I just, I, I felt close, but we weren't there with what could, this could possibly be. Plus if, if I'm transparent, um, my interest is really at the bedside. It wasn't with advanced care planning. It just felt like slogging through. Like how many times do we hear, oh, we should get our documents done. We should do all this, right? And it's an important process. But when we talk to people about end of life, they're pretty much like, eh, you know, I'll, I'll have time. I'll get there. Mm. Maybe sooner than later. So what, what was this? It kept coming up. And then I started doing some research and found Dr. Fred or Ferdinando Meraki. I always say to him, I don't know whether to kiss you on the forehead or like, or bow like in a, in a kingly manner because of that name. So we call him um, Dr. Fred Meraki. And he um, created something that to me is groundbreaking. Um, first, he is uh, founded the Institute on Healthcare Directives. Uh, and out of that has come um, this, uh, this advanced directive called MIDEO. And what it stands for is My Informed Decisions on Video. And it's like simple but mind-blowing because why it hasn't been done before, I don't know. And it's Dr. Meraki working 17 years. His backstory is that he was an emergency room doctor and as a young intern, had two incidences where uh, one, he believed that somebody was um, to, be, uh, to be brought back to life, to be resuscitated when they were actually an end of life hospice patient. And thankfully he got thrown out of the way at the last minute while he's trying to save this person to allow natural death. And then he had another experience where um, the opposite, where um, he was going to let them go as a result of that, and they were not uh, a DNR or do not resuscitate. And again, he was thrown out of the way. These two experiences, he said, really rattled him. So he started looking into, number one, the, the misinterpretation rates, which are incredibly high, uh, like up to 90% of first responders, um, nurses, doctors in the emergency room don't get it right, even if you have advanced care directives, these documents. So I was like, oh my God, well, what's the solution? Um, and the thing that was also shocking, if somebody has a DNR, um, that's 
um, usually depending upon what stage they come in, that's also considered do not treat. Many people have a living will that's considered like a DNR. So the, the upshot to all that, that people need to know is there's a lot of wrongful deaths and a lot of wrongful lives, ha li life's lives happening mm -hmm. out there. And either way, not good. And in fact, Dr. Maraki will say himself, and he, he says it with the, with the um, you know, precursor to say, I don't mean to sound crass about this. We don't care whether you want to live or to die. We just want to get it right. We right. want to get it right. So he created this um, powerful advanced directive, which is a video advanced directive. And um, basically the technology is simple, but the way it's put together is amazing, is that you're given an ID card that has a QR code. And you go through, um, and I think you're going through your media session next week, aren't you? The 11th, yeah. The 11th, okay. Um, so basically, you it's the first physician-guided video-based advanced directive. And why that's so important is because when we hear somebody saying what their wishes are, there's no misinterpretation mm -hmm. to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Family dynamics, which also get a little confusing and weird sometimes when somebody's in there, the, the long lost daughter comes, you know, flying in mama, mama, mama. And they say, this is what she want. And it's uh, even attorneys have now said, and um, they've upheld video mm. as to be um, something that is clear. And so uh, clear, concise, uh, it it um, really takes away all the concerns about coercion. And the, the misinterpret Rate goes up to like it, it's ninety like percent. There's some really yes. high thing that it yes accurately interpreted like over ninety percent, ninety eight percent, something like that. So exactly, and the simple technology is where you take everybody's got a a smartphone. They put the uh, phone over. You get an ID card. You put the phone over this QR code, and up in seconds pops the video of the person who they're obviously working on saying, this is how I want to be treated in things that people don't even think about. Like if my cardio, if I have a cardiac arrest and it's witnessed or if it's not witnessed and you don't know how long I've been down things that we might be able to put in a checkbox, but those papers are cumbersome. Most people don't come in with those mm -hmm. and um, they're easily misinterpreted, interpreted. So at, to your point, um, the studies that Dr. Maraki has done, 13 now, now call, he calls them triad studies, uh, show that up to 96% accurately interpret, interpreted, along with the other beauty and benefits that if you're in an emergent situation and there's no time to wait, waste, people can't go calling somebody they think, they can't look at paperwork. So when I found this, I was like, you've got to be kidding me, got in touch with Dr. Maraki shared with them that we've got this network of end-of-life doulas, many of whom are already doing this work, some of whom would like to do this work, and we negotiated some arrangements where they, if they can facilitate and educate, and that's what we're in the process of a pilot program now, um, they can be paid for this work, not only for these bringing clients to Dr. Meraki, but to their local physicians, right. who can be trained to do this, and for them, it's an income stream. For the dual, it's an income stream. And the yeah, beauty, the, the patient. yeah, the, for the patient, that's like the main reason. So, my gosh, I could go on forever. And, um, you know, we're still in the learning process, too, with this pilot. We're putting together with about 70 beautiful doulas, including yourself, or those who may not identify as a doula, but really want to educate this population. Mm -hmm. um, to, to bring informed, shared, informed decision-making. And with a physician, it's the first time where you really get the information about what's the impact of my treatment decisions. What if I'm on a ventilator and you know we're in COVID time? What does that look like? What if I have a brain injury and I need to be in up for short term? All the things that as much as attorneys do good work and these documents are important, Video becomes the clarifier and it becomes that emergent um, tool, that emergency tool. And really what we're talking is patient safety. 
end of life care is included under that umbrella of patient safety. And we as doulas have been trying to push a conversation that nobody wants to have, which is end of life care in your documents. But if we frame it with patient safety, it's an entry point. It's a conversation starter. People at any age and any stage want to remain safe. Yeah. And we can if do I that. Could just, you know, try to get across to everybody, whether they are healthy or not, you know, the result of not having this important paperwork or video, whatever in place, which the majority of people do not who go into an emergency room situation or go into a situation where they have no capacity. They're in a coma. They're knocked out. They've had whatever, you know, the situation is. Yeah. They don't have that in place. The doctors, as wonderful as they are, the hospitals, as wonderful as they are, will do everything to save your life. And yes. some of those things that are done, I mean, I've, are, just seen, I've right. seen too many bad deaths that I've actually had someone ask me to help them remove their trachea out of their Oh my gosh. They couldn't talk, they mouthed it. So it's just like there are there are great ways to wow. go and there are horrible ways to go. And if you don't have that paperwork in place, if you don't have that video card, if you don't have an advocate speaking for you on your behalf, oh my yes. God, it's just it's not good. <laughs> it's so not good. And nobody so, would want to die that way. Nobody. Claire, that's so really beautifully said and articulate. And, and, I, and I'm sure this isn't the experience that you had. That's a thing you can't unknow or unsee from your world. And if you can impart that in any way, shape, or form, and it's not to scare people, it's to empower them that they have so many choices that people don't even know they have. And I, I love that you are doing that out there in your world, wherever your world happens to be. It's well, wonderful I mean, you know, work. You, you were talking about birth and you were talking about buying a car and you were talking about, you know, it's like <laughs> we make choices all the time and we prepare and we plan and we get excited about weddings and graduations and things that people put a lot of effort into it. People don't put any effort into dying. No, and that no. may be like our greatest, most sacred event in our entire life. And we don't put anything into it. Plural. I know. We, not you and me. Yes. Plural yes. The, exactly. Yeah. The, the royal we. It's very, very true. Right. Very yeah. true. Yeah. That's why I say we're, we're, we're breathing the same air and preaching to the converted. But boy, it, it feels good. And if any, you know, one, one heart at a time. Yeah. One life at a time, one death at a time. I mean, um, you know, I think if we put this energetic sense out into the world, and I, and I know you and I have both seen this movement go from people being very siloed in their own world. Um, you know, I think all of us um, kind of sit there and think, like, when we saw the term end of life duel, it's like, wait, that's what I do. I didn't, I didn't know there was a name for it, you know? Yeah. And then you start to connect with other people who are doing this and boom, the next thing you know, a movement has begun. And there are so many amazing people doing this work. Amazing people. I mean, just to be part of that community. Yeah. So incredible. You know, and I have to say, I noticed that you were uh, on a member or working with the Australian end of life doula association or alliance have you like started working with them cheryl or how is well, that are you part of that that would be great i i just what well, i only became part of it because of both you um you and cheryl like uh, i saw that there was um a, an australian um network for this and i was like oh i want to become and of course you know it's sort of like you've got certain questions to answer to become a part of it Mm -hmm. And um, to to become a part of that Facebook group. And, um, you know, I think I might have shared that I, you know, have colleagues that are in Australia. And, 
you know, this isn't just, people don't just die in the U.S., I don't think, do they? Don't they die in Australia? But they probably die a lot nicer in Australia. I don't know. And you know what? But, they um, have a lot of the same problems that we do yeah. when it comes to dying here. But what I liked about, and, you know, I'm just now connecting with that group as well, but it's just like that they are, um, they are exploring just getting the core competencies together that yeah, really yeah. do this need to carry and hold. And they don't have a certification program here like they do there, but I can right. see it coming and yeah. just establishing those core competencies. You know, they're in a lot of ways, they're so progressive here and they're uh, thinking about, you know, birth doulas and things like that. So I think it's going to be wonderful. Uh, uh, they'll be a group that really will work hard and get this done. So, yeah. Well, I mean, between um, NIDA, uh, National End of Life Dual Alliance, I know the UK has um, a big movement for end of life duels. As a matter of fact, um, when I was looking at the quality of death index, I have some friends in Brazil, uh -huh. and quality of death index there was something like um, 39th or uh, maybe even lower than that, meaning that they have have a lot of corruption they can't get medications people are dying in pain you know we talk about here in the US and maybe in, in other countries where we do have the ability not to die in pain but um, these other countries a lot of other countries don't have um, that luxury but the UK on this quality of death index at least the last time I checked was number one was the number one place to die really? Really? well hospice I started there with yeah. um, uh, Cicely uh, Saunders, who um, who brought that, you know, over, well, um, actually Kubler-Ross also brought that um, over here. And um, so between all of our countries, between the U.S., Australia, U.K., Canada, there's some really cool movements like that I think are starting to inform the world. And when this death-averse population like our age and older mm -hmm. starts to die off in terms of not being able to talk about or prepare for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know um, I'm glad that my, my mother prepared for it. My father was an attorney who helped people with their estates and he did not um, prepare his own. And thankfully he died in a blink of the eye, 12 hours after my parents 50th anniversary party. It was shocking, but the best for my father because he would have made a miserable patient we might have we might have had problems with him but people who um help other people plan were not planning i think that's changing i see i see this changing and a lot less grief and um just uh a, a lot uh, well let me put it in the positive i think it's just going to be um a, people are going to start to see the the sacred and the beauty to uh, in, in death, yeah. Uh, Patty, thank you so much for taking the time to coming on here. I just, I could talk to you for a long time. And I'm sure we'll talk no, a lot more later. I know. But if people wanted to uh, reach you and talk to you about um, anything that we've talked about today or just to get more information about any of these organizations or the things that you do, what's the best way to sure. hold of you? The best way would be um, to go to doingdeathdifferently.com. Okay. Um, if they want to see what we're doing with this project, which is very cool, it's doingdeathdifferently.com forward slash Midio, and that's M as in Mary, I-D as in dog, E-O, Midio, like video. Mm -hmm. um, the teaching transition side of my business is for the hospices, but uh, I've, I've sort of separated it only because Years ago, it was very separate, hospice and doula, and now there's a lot more of an overlap. But, um, you know, it's all, however you, you uh, find us, we would love to talk with you because we really want to do death differently. We want to transform that experience of death from only fear and sadness and overwhelm to peace, connection, meaning, joy, and hopefully a little bit of awe. I love being part of the same choir. <laughs> oh I know. I know. It's I so love great. working with you, Patty. Thank you so I much for being with, you. with us. I just, I thank just you. can't thank you enough. Thank you, Claire. It is my pleasure and uh, lots more to come for the two of us, I'm sure. Me too. Take good care. Bye.